Hello, comic book fans. Uh, welcome back for episode two of Have You Read This Yet? I hope you missed us, because we missed you. I'm Blair Walton Alex, and I'm your host for the show. Uh, we are here to talk about comic books and how they fit into the pop culture landscape. And I'm joined by two new guests this week. I'm so happy to have you guys with us. We are joined by Gabriel Ransomberg, who heads up the Graphic Novel Club for the Windsor Park Library here in Austin, and Allegra Fox, who does everything. She writes, she sings, she is an actress, and is a comic book fan. So thank you guys so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, first thing I wanted to ask, what are you guys reading? Um, so uh, my book club, uh, the next book we're reading is uh, Vlad the Impaler, which is a small press uh, book about the original Dracula. I actually haven't read it yet, so oh. I can't speak much to it. But, you have um, homework to do. Yes, exactly. You have homework. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's all right. But outside of that, um, I, I've been, well, let's see. I guess I read the, the, la the newest book I've read was The Cosmic Ghost Rider uh, by Donnie Cates. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Who's from here in Austin, Texas. Oh, cool. Um, Local boy. Yeah, um, which is cool. It's a continuation of the Thanos story that he wrote about. And the premise of that was, what if Thanos, the, the, the big bad guy from all those Avenger movies. Right. What if he, You've used, heard what, of those. What if he <laughs> succeeds and wipes out the entire, like all living things in the universe? Oh, like, okay. So then what? And so that's kind of where this, this story picks up. Okay. Like, so he's already killed everything, and so now what? Just hanging out. Oh, so yeah. he kills everything, yeah. like not the, oh. No, there's all... actually really exciting things happening. But yeah, that's that's kind of the premise. That you start off like, yep, he, he won. Now what? It's called Thanos Wins. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, from that bleak space, Allegra, what are you reading? <laughs> so it started for me trying to find Pitch Black, and then I guess I accidentally, not accidentally, I started the Cosmo, some Amazon thing, so now I have all this unlimited comics, and Saga's one of them, so I want to reread Ooh, Saga, because nice. I nice started, call. yeah, I started it, and it was really, really good, and then, like, life happened, and theater happened, and music happened, so I, like, ended at a point where, like, a really good point, and so now I'm just like, I want to reread it, and get caught up because my friend put a status on it on Facebook ages ago about something happening. Oh, no. Yeah, so now I got to, like, get caught up on that. And then the one that I have downloaded, have not looked at it, but now because of San Diego Comic-Con, I'm, like, now going to go full Thor is I'm going to read She-Thor. Ooh, nice. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. like, I was, it, like, saw it in the corner of my eye at the comic book store years ago and then mm -hmm. went, all right, I'll get back to it. But now that, like, things have been announced. Yeah. Like really cool things have been announced. I'm like, all right, all right, I'm in. I'm yeah, in, I'm in. I'm gonna read it. Let's see what happens. It's it's solid. It's a it's a good ah, one. Ah, yes, I'm excited. So uh, my personal favorite that I've been digging lately has been uh, the new Lois Lane series. And if you have not read it yet, it is okay. We have a sneak preview for you to check out and get caught up right now. So check it out. Grab your press pass because we are tagging along with the most prolific journalist in the DC universe. This is Lois Lane. Written by acclaimed author Greg Rucka, this new series follows hard-nosed Daily Planet reporter Lois Lane. You probably know her as Superman's girlfriend, or the lady he's always having to catch out of midair. Easy, miss. I've got you. This limited series run puts away the capes and focuses in on Lois as she starts digging in on a new conspiracy. Who is behind the death of a Russian journalist? And what was she working on before she died? Lois needs help, but this does not look like a job for Superman. In fact, he's pretty much sidelined for the first part of the series. No. Neither Superman nor Clark Kent can keep Lois from getting shot at, or do anything about her being publicly shamed for kissing Superman while she's married to Clark Kent. I blame this on no one using phone booths anymore. Anyway, this turns out to be a great gig for detective-turned-vigilante Renee Montoya, better known now as The Question. Both go on to crack heads, one with her writing, and the other one in a much more literal sense. The whole thing has a strong All the President's Men vibe. It's a non -denial denial. At one point, Lois tells Renee they need to meet privately, or full Woodward. But Rucka isn't borrowing from just one political scandal. Early on, Lois gets her press credentials pulled for questioning a press secretary who seems modeled very strongly after Sarah Huckabee Sanders about the government taking kickbacks from companies being granted contracts to run so-called tender care camps. The story draws a strong parallel to the immigration crisis at the southern border and detention centers operating there. 
But getting into politics isn't new territory for comics. In fact, some of the most iconic characters in comics got their start taking on real-world crises. Think Captain America punching out Hitler, or Ayatollah Khomeini showing up in Batman. And recent comics have commented on everything from 9-11, to conflicts in the Middle East, to government corruption. Rucka continues a tradition of holding a mirror up to the real world and having a character in the panels deal with it. Only this time, it's not somebody in tights. Rucka is quoted in the New York Times as saying Lois has a laptop, a bunch of pencils, and a raft of notepads. That's more than enough to get her into deep trouble, and used effectively, more than enough to get her out of it. Uh, all right, so... Yeah, it's, uh, this series has been really fascinating. We're still early stages in. I think it's just like a 12-issue run, so it's going to be pretty short. Uh, written by Greg Rucka, who's one of my personal favorite authors, and it's a lot of like her doing like Watergate-type journalism. And it's kind of fun. We do see Superman, but he's kind of just hanging out and not really doing like punchy things. Um, but it is a lot of... Um, she's doing articles on detention centers. And uh, there's a, uh, a dead journalist in Russia that she's investigating. So it's a lot of like real world elements kind of filtering down into the comic book, which is kind of fun because I think that's one of the fun things about comics is you do see the real world kind of drift into those and kind of create those stories. But like what kind of comics have you guys seen where that kind of happens, where real world instances kind of get into the meat of the story? Um, well, actually, uh, so the, I mean, this is a book written specifically about a real world incident. Um, so maybe slightly off, but. Um, I just read it not too long ago, and it, it, I'm from Cincinnati, so it's called Six Days in Cincinnati, and it's about the uh, 2001 riots in Cincinnati. Um, then the whole the, the whole story is like the there was a Timothy, I forget his name, poop. Anyway, uh, he was an unarmed black man shot, or actually I think teenager shot by the police. It was like the 15th unarmed black male shot by the police in like maybe three or four years and like yeah. the whole city just like blew up. Yeah. Um, and so this is this is a written by a 17 year old white um, like high school student um, who basically kind of chronicles his his journalism like as he like cause he, he he'd heard about this and that, that things were starting to happen. So he went downtown and spent six days down there interviewing people and talking to people and very much like he in the book he's aware of like his privilege and being able to do that and like his, his position because he puts himself in the book but not as like a hero just like yeah um, he's very honest about like like who he is telling the story um, and the, actually the really depressing thing about it is like at the end of it like city the mayor and everybody comes together and they're like, we're gonna do something about this and you know damn well like nothing really happened because yeah it's what, like 18 years later and yeah like no no ma this. right like, exactly um, you know and the, the book was originally titled Mark Twain was right um, because it was literally it was exactly ten years since the um, the nineteen ninety one uh, uh, Ronnie King. Ronnie King, thank you. Sorry, Ugh, bad names, but yes. <laughs> uh, um, so yeah, the, and Mark Twain famously said that ev if, if the world ever ends, I'm going to move to Cincinnati because everything hits there ten years later. Not quite like a superhero story with real world elements, right, but right. it was the most recent like real world kind of graphic novel I've read. Yeah. So. I was gonna say the only one that pops in my head just because it's coming back with the mm. HBO series is Watchmen. You know, yeah. I'm a I'm I was born in 1989, so you know the civil not civil the Cold War is just something I, I know about it. I've seen some documentaries about it, but I just mm -hmm. didn't understand the level of paranoia. Yeah, and watch and like reading that, it's just like oh my god, like just the fact of how close you know Russia and America were so many times yeah. and then just like the doomsday clock you know mm -hmm. I was just like what, what what is a doomsday clock you know yeah and then even like now especially with like a post 9-11 world of like you know people just riddled with conspiracies of trying to mm -hmm. you know what if like something just totally complete like the worst case that absolutely happens could it bring the world together could you know just Reading it, because I've, read, I've reread it several times, and now especially with what's going on now in the world, you're just like, ugh, you know. Yeah. We're, did we really, like, did that Cold War really end? Sort yeah. of thing, you know? Yeah. And I, yeah, that one kind of ranged true. And then, um, to me, especially now with, like, the Civil War, uh, Civil War with Marvel, 
Mm-hmm. The whole yeah. thing about, you know, um, how much power can you give people? Yeah. You know, to go into these countries and to do what they do and to leave and not be held accountable. Yeah, you yeah. Know, especially with, like, the whole Iraq war that we had and the, the first, like, both of them, Vietnam. You're going in there, you're not being held accountable. Like, what is the point of it? You know, mm-hmm. is America going to always be the police of the entire world? And are these people wanting that? Did what, did they want that help in the first place? Yeah. Well, and it's interesting you bring up Watchmen too, because uh, with the new HBO series that's going to be coming out, and you know, all we've seen is trailers so far that have been released from you know from Comic Con, as you mentioned earlier. That's a tie-in, folks. That's what we do here because we're classy like that. Um, but it looks like you know from what we've seen thus far, they are going to tie in those elements from the the original series. But it does look like it's focusing a lot on. Uh, police brutality and the idea of like communities fighting back against that and then what happens whenever cops want to mask their identity quite literally Um, but I mean it is kind of like a lot of those real world situations kind of coming into that show and taking a lot from you know that original series of you know these conflicts and who who has power and how do you use that and can you really bring people together with you know you know acts of violence in a sense Mm -hmm. Um, and I think like this seems like a good point since you did mention uh, comic books that are more based on real world events. We can kind of dive into our, our book of the month, which is Pitch Black. Uh, this came out in 2008, and we have a nice little review for you to check out because, again, we're here for you to come and enjoy. And if you haven't a chance to read it, we want you to, you know, still be caught up and enjoy this conversation. So check out our review of Pitch Black. It's a side of New York City that few people see, and our guide is a man who's made this world his home. This is Pitch Black. Set in New York City in the late 2000s, Pitch Black is a story of how the author and the artist of this graphic novel meet, and the world that he introduces her to. Anthony Horton finds Yumi Landau admiring an ad in the subway, and asks her if she likes the art. She says yes, that specifically, she likes the graffiti that people can take something and adapt it. Anthony understands that admiration. He has made his life out of adapting. Because Anthony, we learn, is homeless and living underground in the subway system. We see Anthony sharing the story of his life with Yumi, about how he was given up for adoption at birth and after bouncing around to different places, aged out of the system. When he sought out new services, he was sent somewhere new. Hell, otherwise known as a homeless shelter. Anthony leaves after a short stay, but his life outside the shelter is occupied with just trying to find a place to sit, a place to sleep. Hopping a turnstile leads the cops to chasing him down the subway, and he leaps onto the tracks. The cops stop chasing after him, but he runs deeper and deeper into the darkness. And it's in this darkness that he finds a community. People take him in, care for him, teach him the things that he needs to know to survive. In real life, Anthony and Yumi collaborated to write and draw this graphic novel. In an interview, Yumi said, if it were just Anthony, it would have been vampires and werewolves. And if it was just me, it would have been a children's book. But together, we made this. This book didn't pull Anthony out of homelessness. He died in a fire in 2012 in the tunnels beneath New York City. He got an obituary in the New York Times. The book was mentioned, but they also talked about people describing him as a happy, caring person. They described him as the least faceless person down there. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed our review of Pitch Black. We were just discussing the fact that uh, this lovely copy, if you would like to check it out, is available through the Austin Library System, but... um, which you were going to check out, yep. but um, you actually, it, this is that copy. It's this one right here. <laughs> so <laughs> We will return this after this episode is done, so you can probably find it now. So, you know, no worries. This copy is back in rotation, hopefully somewhere. So, you know, good for you. Uh, <laughs> all right, so um, I wanted to know, had you guys uh, read this graphic novel before, uh, before we asked you to come on? No, I hadn't ever heard of it. Oh, okay. Uh, what were your first takeaways from it? Uh, I, the art felt really cool. I, yeah. Almost like um, it, it gave me the feeling because of kind of the, the the wavy lines. Like it was drawn like on location, like not like in like a studio. Like like mm-hmm. like it felt like somebody with a notepad, like in the subway, like drawing these pictures, um, watching people. Like every, everything felt really like grounded in in reality. Um, at least with with the art. Um, story was really simple, but. Um, moving it reminded me of a, a documentary from 2000 called uh, Dark Days. 
Yeah, we were talking about this a little yeah. bit beforehand. Have you seen that? Yeah. No, I haven't. Yeah, a small documentary, but it was, the documentary is about um, a community that lives in the New York subway system. Like it, it, it was shot all through the '90s, so it's it's this community of people that live in an abandoned subway tunnel. They called it Freedom City, I think, is the name of it. But like. Um, this documentary maker lived with them for a while and he made the documentary to try to like raise money for them, like to help them out. Um, ultimately, after it came out, um, Amtrak was gonna move into that subway tunnel and start sending trains through it. And he worked with a commission and got everybody housing vouchers and the people that were living down there, he got them homes like oh, in nice. New York. Uh, but anyway, uh, cool documentary. If you haven't checked it out, the library has a copy of that as well. <laughs> So the show's a plug for the library. It's, it's you should go there. It's fine. But anyway, anyway, like what about you? What did you take away from it? I mean, you already took my point is with the the uh, the drawings. Mm -hmm. It was just like the beginning of it. Like I don't know. It just immediately it pulled me in. You know, because sometimes like with comics, I mean, it was just the first thing that caught me off guard was just I'm like, oh, this is entirely entirely in black and white. Like mm -hmm. you know, I thought like, oh, there's going to be a point where it goes into color, and I was like, okay, it doesn't. And I thought, okay, am I gonna like this element? Am I not? But like, I found myself, especially like I was in the break room, reading it on my phone, really, really quiet. Like, I just got me into what he saw, and like the pitch black, especially like when he's describing when he first goes into those tunnels. Like, I really got into his world a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, it was stronger than I thought it would be. Yeah. Yeah, and and since you read it on a, on a phone, like, there's a cool thing. Like one pan one page, like they actually flip. Flips, yeah, like this. Yeah, one. yeah. that this is yeah, this yeah. is exactly this is what I wanted to see. Yeah, so like, like it gives you that like sense of like six stories underground. Wow. And see this, I think, and I'll flip this around so everyone, oh. so everyone can see. Yeah. Uh, but no, I think this this one thing's I, I what makes me love graphic novels as a, as a storytelling uh, medium in a sense is that you you're not going to see this in a lot of other types of storytelling where it's like we're going to take the the format and just like flip it like this and it's it's just I don't I mean well I guess film you could probably do that too but it's it's kind of a beautiful way to sort of shift the perspective of the storytelling and it is like a lovely way to sort of really illustrate because I mean the the line here is six stories below the city and you're drifting down and it gets darker and darker as you get further and further yeah it almost has that uh ah, what's it called paradise loss like what is it uh Dante's inferno is oh, what yeah. I was yes. thinking yeah, just yeah. like we're the drifting. levels mm -hmm. and as you get closer to the center of it, it just gets bleaker and bleaker and fewer and fewer people, yeah. so. Well, in the format also, like, the, for the rest of it, like, because it's long strips, it gives you that feeling of, like, like tunnels, you know, like, like the, the, there's not much movement on the sides, but there's, it, everything's very long yeah. um, and stretching, so I felt like there was, there was a lot of thought put into, like, the reason why this book is kind of an odd format size. Um, I think it was all part of serving the storytelling. Kind of give you that feel. Yeah, and then exactly. there's a, a frame, or a frame, TV talk, it's fun. Uh, there is a page very early in where you're seeing uh, the folks on the subway going by. And it's just oh, this, yeah. this very long shot where you're just seeing like the whole car just full of people. And it is kind of like this lovely moment of just, it, I think it is very, you know, a very thoughtful way to, to uh, you know, to lay it out where it's just like, here, here's everyone. And here's everyone that is not seeing our main character, Tony. Mm -hmm. And he's sort of going through this place. And I think there's a point in it where he says, just pretend like you're supposed to be here. No one will ask you questions. Yes. And I, was, yeah. I remember that when like, when she finally was just like, you know, just don't act like you just came from under there. Just keep, just walk like you belong. Yeah. Like that stuck with me. Yeah. Uh, and Yumi was interviewed um, at an event in Denver a few years ago, and she was talking about how uh, Tony loved to draw. And you see some of his illustrations in the book, which is really great. And was she is she the the woman character in the story? Like, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like the the uh, framing is is her first meeting with him, and she's okay. like word for word that is how we met. So I was staring at a drawing, and he came up and asked like, "Oh, do you like art?" And like that's how they met each other. Yeah, and I love that too, because because they, they they're talking about like graffiti on like an advertisement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's like in the little corner. I can't think of what I think it, it said. He was on her lip or something. Yeah. You're not you're alone. You're not alone. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's the kickoff to the relationship. And she said, We're, that, is, that is in fact how they did meet, was you know, they just struck up a conversation. And then it, it, you know, it, it created this story. Yeah. Um, it, I have to say, like, uh, we've been doing a lot of stories um, on our news uh, program here, Decibel, about homelessness this month, um, which you can su subscribe to this channel and you can see all those stories. They're great. Uh, but um, a lot of the stuff that he talked about really reminded me a lot of stuff going on here in Austin right now with all the homeless ordinance changes and people's reaction to that. And I was curious if you guys kind of got some of that feeling as well. It, yeah, um, cause 
I'm not gonna lie, it's just like with a lot going on, yeah. I, it's one of those things that like I heard about it and like a lot of the times I always, it's really interesting with news these days, you always hear everyone's reaction to a thing. Right. So like my friend will text me about it and I'm like, okay, let's rewind, what just happened? Yeah. So when that ordinance happened, I was actually really, you know, I was surprised at how a lot of my friends react where they're just like, okay, well now their tents are gonna be everywhere. And mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, but like, have you been on 7th Street? Have you seen where this place is? Like, you know, it's like any homeless shelter, you have to get there for a certain time. If you don't, you know, there's the beds are full, now you have to go other places. I'm like, mm -hmm. these are people that probably tried to go there. And I was a little surprised at how like, not sympathetic people were to it, mm -hmm. but it's just one of those, well, you know, what can we do? Yeah, you know, like I, I, I get it's like it's 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 just weird because like I understand both sides of the argument, but at the same time, I'm like they got you know we have to do something. Yeah, right. Well, and the <clears throat> the laws before were, I mean, this is a step away from criminalizing being homeless. Like, I mean, that's the idea. Like you you allow people like as long as they're not blocking you know the the throughway and they're not yeah. causing a, a you know an imminent danger, like they can camp out on public space. I don't see a problem with that right. because. Um, the before, like um, I was, I was telling you earlier. Yeah, I yeah. used to work um, downtown on Fourth Street, and there was a bench right outside of where I worked. And every week, I would see cops walk by and harass homeless people for sitting on those benches. They never harassed like a business guy smoking a cigarette, like on a break or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if they saw somebody, didn't matter like how long they had been there, they could have just sat down. If their like shoes were floppy and like they lo looked like had you know, looked visibly homeless, the cops were harassing them, telling them they had to get up and move. Like, so essentially, like, creating a second class of citizens, like, within our society, like, you know, those who have a place to stay and those who don't. Um, so, I mean, people are really overreacting to something, like, uh, that is ultimately, like, trying to make laws more humane for everybody. And, like, I, I don't know. Uh, I think a lot of people have the idea that homeless situation is solved when you just shovel them somewhere else where you can't see them anymore. I mean, right. that's what happens every time the Olympics go to a different city, like, you know, a, a couple months beforehand, they go through and they basically shovel all the yeah. homeless people somewhere else, like, get on get on a bus and get out of town, like, because we don't want tourists to see that people don't have homes in our town. Um, that's not how you solve the problem. Um, so this isn't like a solution to the problem, like 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 allowing people to camp on the streets, but it is a step in the right direction, a step a step towards humanity and a step towards helping people, because um, most people don't want to be homeless. Like right, it, it's a small percentage of homeless people who chose to be homeless. Like and so anyway. Well, and I think you see that perfectly in in this book too, where we're hearing from Tony about how he was uh, in the foster care system. Uh, you know, did not find uh, or was not given a stable home in that system and then is just kind of bouncing around to different places trying to find a place to just stay. And there, there is uh, several um, frames within the, the graphic novel where he is getting pushed or chased by the cops to leave a certain area and literally is chased by the cops into the tunnels. I think well, like yeah. that. That's what drives him there initially. Is just and like, he notices that once he hits the tunnels, the cops just they don't they don't they pursue stop. him anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Like, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. So, and I think brings up another interesting point too. It's, not, it's something I thought about as I was reading through it. Is that he um, keeps going further into the tunnels and uh, starts realizing that people are there, and he is, was unaware of this before going in. He was just trying to like get away from the cops, and. Uh, it sort of struck me that um, you know we've been talking to several experts throughout the month about um, you know the homeless ordinance, and the thing they keep saying is that um, these people have always been living somewhere. You just did not see them, and it struck me a lot about this: is like there these people are here. There's not an invisible place, but they are making a life for themselves. And there is a really great point here I want to talk about too: uh, the page of things you need to survive. Um, which I thought was like a, oh, yeah. a fascinating panel of here's what you need to have, here's your must have list to get by down yeah. here. Um, which I thought was really interesting, like the stuff you needed to have. Oh yeah. Well also the way they portray the homeless shelter in, in this book. I mean mm -hmm. like it's not a place, like he ended up not wanting to go back. Like yeah. even though there was a bed for him there, like there were so many other awful things like surrounding a, a place that is underfunded and overcrowded mm -hmm. and like understaffed, like, um, like I don't know. I think it points out a lot of the the problems with how we treat homelessness. We don't mm -hmm. we don't want to like address that as an issue. Um, we just want to kind of shovel it to the side. Yeah. Um, but it is an issue, and like any issue, it requires like funding and you know the willpower of people to like actually change it and make it better. Right. Yeah, especially absolutely. in a city like Austin. Austin is so expensive. You mm -hmm. know, it's one of those things. Like when I tell people, I'm like, you know, you you think. 
homelessness is so far from you, but it's like two wrong things mm -hmm. for someone living paycheck to paycheck, and you can be in that exact situation. Absolutely. And who's yeah. to say that that's not something that happened to that those people? You know, like I remember reading a um, an Ask Reddit column where they were just like people that were homeless. List. Like, what was your story? And a lot of them, you, like, you know, everyone always wants to say, you know, mental illness. And it's like some people were just like, I just, just one bad thing after another kept happening. Mm -hmm. And this city is so expensive. And that was like kind of my argument with it, where I'm like, I understand what y'all are saying, but like, the city's expensive. Yeah. You know, you can't find affordable housing. It's like, okay, cool, you, you got a job working at a Burger King or a McDonald's, but like most people cannot get by with that. No. Yeah. And so it's just like like you said, it's like it's it's a solution. It's not the best solution, but it's like until we have the real conversation, affordable housing in this city for people. Yeah. You know, we're trying to I don't know. It's it's baby steps, but yeah, at exactly. least it's in the in That's a positive right. direction. Exactly, yeah. it's like it's a step. It's a step in the right direction, and it's like, you know, because it's like you can't tell someone, okay, all of a sudden, like, let's do affordable housing. Mm -hmm. All right, you don't want to do that. Okay, cool. Well, then let's just allow them to at least make a home, so that they can sleep comfortably, as comfortably as they can. Yeah, yeah. but I did, I did find that really interesting that you know, he received basic human kindness once he went into like the darkest part of the city. Yeah. You know, when yeah. he was in the light, he's ignored, mm -hmm. he's shooed away, he, you know, the shelter's an absolute just, you know, is just ha havoc, but then the, the further he gets into the dark, instead of it being, you know, even though it's dark, phys you know, physically, it's like a beacon of light. Yeah. And Oh, no, yeah, that's good. Like that no, that brings me like the, the one last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up uh, is just that, that notion of, um, finding a community and socialization. And I think that that's like perfectly sums it up because um, I, something we keep hearing from people is just the fact that you as a homeless person can go out in public and just be routinely ignored. And, like you're obviously taking up space, you're occupying a place in a street, you know, or, or wherever you happen to be and people will just do everything to not look at you for, for the most part. Some people will and that's great. Um, but there, a lot of people will not talk to you or, you know, make eye contact or, or recognize your existence. And then to, um, you know, you know, like you said, to go into complete darkness to find light and find hope and find community, which he talks about in here, here's the people that helped me survive. And that's this really great plan panel of faces. Oh, I was, yeah, I was, gonna, I was like, can we look at those faces? Yes, no, the faces like, are great. It's a beautiful oh, part. It's I, like I love, my favorite part. No, I it's, it's, it was... a, it's wonderful. And I mean, um, and the fact that like this story comes out of the fact that someone stopped and talked to him. Oh, and that looks even better. And then, yeah. yeah. No, it, it's it's a great moment of just. Well, and I think it's no, ultimately it's lovely, like yeah. tragic and beautiful yeah. that he he ended up from from this point till he died what, what, six years ago, mm. seven years ago, that he died in these tunnels. Like I mean, he yeah. stayed there for so I mean, it's tragic that that had to happen, but also I get he was around this community of people who accepted him, like yeah. and he and it was able to stay with them. And the thing you know. is, is that he found a, like he found a community. You know, at the yeah. end of the day, we're all trying to find a community. And some people, like uh, people that live above, still cannot even find a community. But the fact that life gave him this, this you know, this bucket of lemons and he made it work yeah. and still found a sense of community in a place that, you know, we would kind of do this, but it's like, oh wait, no, he was able to find it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and but the, the ultimate tragedy but, is that. But yeah, but the fact the, is, the, he found all it these this people way. Were driven right. Below ground, just to be able to find that community. Exactly. That's, that's tragic, but but he found it. So yeah, I mean, the, not yeah, not horror, not not a total tragedy. Right. It's, yeah. No, I know what you mean because it's like I'm reading it, going like, this is beautiful, but ah, uh, why? Yeah. Like, right. Ugh, like, yeah. I think it's definitely like overall, it's, it's a very like kind of bittersweet story to read because there is something like just his his story is, is kind of it's very like very tragic and very sad. But there are these moments of just like very like sweet, happy things and, and lovely things where he finds community. I love the fact that like he talks about his dog Meatball, yeah. which is, you know, and just these little moments of like, you know, you, you found a piece and that's you know, it makes you happy for that person. Mm -hmm. um, is there any any other main topics you guys wanted to hit on with the book? Anything that we missed that we haven't talked about? I just I just love the artwork. I've just you know yeah. Yeah. I I'm not gonna sit here and say like I've read like so many so many graphic novels, but I've just this is just it just stood out to me just by the graphics alone. Mm -hmm. And then like I said, especially to see it like this and not on my phone, it's just very. It's a beautiful conclusion. Yeah, I mean, bittersweet. Yeah, well, and and the the choice of making it monochromatic um, like serves the story perfectly. I mean, it, yeah. I, yeah, it just it, if it looked like in a standard, I just don't think I would have. 
had the reaction that I would. But yeah, mm -hmm. I thought like, you know. Well, light's such an important part of the story. I mean, so yeah. I, Cause this definitely would have thrown me off if I would have looked in the library and been like, this is the book? Okay, yeah. okay. Like, not what I thought it, it was gonna but, be. The library yeah. category puts that, this is in the uh, teen graphic novel section, not the adult graphic novel section. Oh. Which I thought was great actually. Yeah. Um, because it, you know, it'll hopefully like a teen coming across this would get something out of it and maybe then become a much better adult. And, and, yeah. that, and my thing is, I'm like, especially like, I, I actually like that because, you know, homelessness, I'm needs to be, I think the earlier you address it, the better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, because yeah. especially like, you know, little kids are gonna do what their parents do, and if their parents are ignoring them, you know, that's that's not a good thing. No, I mean, yeah. empathy's learned, like, and the earlier you learn it, the better. Yeah. And that was one thing that when I was reading, like when I was reading this ask form, and they just went, you know, I just, you know, people wouldn't look me in the eye. And I remember like reading that young, when I was younger and going, okay, I'm going to make a point, you know, to just look them in the eye and have a conversation. Yeah. And just, you know, even just, look him in the eye and be like, I acknowledge you. Yeah. You know. I think that pretty much wraps it up for this week. I wanted to ask if you guys uh, had anything you wanted wanted to plug before we say goodbye to everybody. Any um, events, things people want to check out? Where should yeah. they go? So I, I work at the Windsor Park Library um, on Westminster, uh, just south of 290. And um, I have, we do our book club there, my graphic novel book club. It's um, every first mon Monday of the month. Um, also, I do a show for the Austin Public Library YouTube. Uh, called The Van Show. Uh, it's where a blue puppet interviews authors, children's book authors, teen book authors. I've also interviewed some graphic novel authors, um, Nathan Hale and Penelope Bougeau. Um, there's 150 episodes on the Austin Public Library website, so you can check those out. And we'll have a link for that down down in the comment section of all of this, so if you want to check that out, that will be easy for you to access. Awesome. Allegra, what about yourself? My band, Jade and the Fox Tones, will be having a residency at uh, Butterfly Bar, which if you're a theater kid, you know that that's the Vortex. And then <laughs> right after that, I am going to be in a show called Jump with Shrewd Productions that will be downtown. Don't want to give much away, but it is a drama about uh, Sister Bond and just the power of growing from tragedy. Awesome. That's really great. Well, um, you guys should definitely check out all of those things because they're fantastic. Thank all of you guys for joining us for episode two. Uh, look forward for episode three. That'll be coming out soon-ish. Get excited. Uh, and uh, if you want to check out more stories on homelessness or just other issues going on in Central Texas, you can check out the rest of this channel. Like and subscribe it to keep up to date on other stuff going on in Central Texas. Again, I am Blair Waltman-Alexon with Decibel, and this is Have You Read This Yet? <laughs> <laughs>